Hello, science enthusiasts. Welcome to Science Chat. Every week we bring you somebody amazing to enthrall you with your their area of knowledge. Sometimes we'll talk about chemistry. Sometimes we'll talk about space. But we'll probably always talk about pets. <laughs> Our guest this week is Danielle Bush, who's a chemist that works in the lab and the kitchen. And uh, after a brief interview, I got some fun questions to ask her. We're going to open up the floor to questions from the audience. So keep your questions ready. Request the mic in a little bit. Not just yet. Um, and same thing on Clubhouse. Uh, if you're on Clubhouse and you're listening, you just have to wait a sec. We gotta, we're we going to talk a little bit to Daniel first so you get to know who this person is. And then we can invite you up. So without further ado, without further ado, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Here, a drum roll. There we go. Welcome to SciChat, Daniel. How's it going? It's going pretty good. It, um, I am going to have to ask your listeners to please forgive the occasional cough. I actually just tested positive for the coronavirus. Oh, no. Are you doing okay? Like, are you okay to talk? I'm okay to talk. Okay. I, I, I've gone back and forth a few times today, but uh, no, I'm, I'm completely fine. Like I said, it's just okay. the occasion cough for clearing of my throat but overall i am doing i am doing fine thank you okay well daniel you let me know if you feel like your voice is waning um because i mean we can we can we can wrap it up if you're not feeling well if if it uh it's like a bit of a problem in a bit no nope, it's fine so all right well okay well you're a trooper for being here um that's pretty amazing danielle where are you in the world where are you calling into the show from I live in Westchester, Illinois. It is a suburb of Chicago. Okay. I have to say that because if I tell people I'm from Chicago and there are actually Chicagoans who are listening, they will get very angry at me because suburban heights <laughs> are. So it's one of those things you have to be from Chicago proper to call yourself from Chicago. Is that what's going on? Correct. Yeah. <laughs> Side of Illinois thinks I'm from Chicago. Anyone inside of Illinois knows I am not from Chicago. I see. Yeah. Chris, is that like any city in Canada? Like probably around Toronto. Like if you say you're from Toronto, but you're in the GTA, the greater Toronto area, the Torontonians probably would get pretty upset with you. I'm not sure. Like the there's the cities and then the suburbs and then they go out and you could be like, I'm from Sherwood Park, but that's like by Edmonton. Yeah, but nobody knows where Sherwood Park is. It sounds like you're Robin Hood when you say you're from Sherwood Park. <laughs> what do you... It what does. are you doing? You're robbing from the rich and giving to the poor? No, I just live that... in a suburb of Edmonton. Shut up. So anyways. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Dan Danielle, could you talk uh, I'll just a little bit about what your background in science is? Because we're going to get into some of the cool stuff that you do. Sure. Um, I actually kind of tripped and fell into chemistry, interestingly enough, because um, – I had always been interested in in science in general, but uh, I didn't necessarily know exactly what I wanted to do with it. And my dad, who has always been so supportive of me, also wanted me to be a self-sufficient woman. So uh, he wanted to make sure I, I was able, I had enough you know, finances to be able to support myself. So when he found out I was interested in science, he did a lot of um, research about, uh, you know, some of the higher paying science gigs and he came up with engineering. Okay. And so he, you know, it wasn't a, it wasn't, he wasn't pushing me into it, but he suggested it. And since, like I said, I didn't really know as I was graduating what specifically I wanted to do, I started studying engineering and, uh, three years in, I realized that I hated it. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, changed my major to chemistry and, uh, well, I changed my major to forensic science, actually, mm. but uh, um, with all these, with all the overlap classes, I actually ended up with my forensic science degree as well as a minor in analytical chemistry. Right. We talked on the podcast about some of the forensic stuff that you got to take. That sounded fascinating. Is there like one course that sticks out to you? Like one of the things that you, you took? Um. <laughs> the one that really stuck out to stuck out to me, and this is going to sound pretty bad, but uh, we had to take a a class where 
Um, we had to learn kind of what to look for when it came to, you know, drugs, basically, you know, how to, how to spot people growing their own weed, how to spot meth lab, <laughs> okay. things like that. Yeah. And so they were basically, for lack of a better term, they were teaching us how to make these things so we can know what to look for in people who make these things. And it was an awesome class. Um, <laughs> It'd be so much fun. I mean, like, if you're not a criminal, you always are like, oh, I wonder how, what the criminals are doing over there. Right. Yeah. So it and it was really kind of interesting. And of course, it wasn't like a, a step by step like recipe on how oh. to make these. <laughs> it wait, was more of wait, 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 wait. So you you weren't like, oh, sorry, that's an ad. I had something queued up here. So, one second, Daniel. I'm so sorry. So uh-huh. it wasn't like, um, you know, Breaking Bad. <laughs> okay. Anyways. <laughs> Everyone says that when they find out that I am a chemist with a forensics background and, and <laughs> on that story, like, oh, Breaking Bad. Like, no, I have never in my life had a desire to make meth. <laughs> I'm sorry I cut you off. I apologize. That was That's a, okay. It was a cool course, right? It was a very cool course. Um, but there was a lot. There was a ton of courses that I took that were just really, really interesting. There was um, I did a blood uh, pattern analysis class. We did, um, you know, anthropology for to to be able to, to detect the bones and things. Of oh, course, yeah. the the downside is the more classes that I took, the less I can watch the TV shows like the CSI and Bones and Law and Order. <laughs> it was so bad. <laughs> you don't like David Caruso? I no, honestly, and it's not it's it's not the show itself. It's just the science in it is so bad. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, I talked to um, I talked to uh, uh, Layla Periello on the podcast, and she works uh, worked as a corner assistant, and and she works in forensic science. And she's like, yeah, it's all a bunch of hooey. It's a bunch of garbage. It it is. It really <laughs> is. So Danielle, you ping ponged around a bit, and now you have a new job. Um, mm-hmm. Now, I know you can't t- tell us everything about your new job because maybe like Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones are going to show up and flash <laughs> the light at me and I'm not going to remember who I am. But could you talk to us a little bit about your 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 new job with pharmaceuticals? <laughs> so the company I work for is called Eurofins. They are what, what, what amounts to a placement company. So they have their own um, staff scientists that they place into other labs. And there is a pile of papers about as tall as I am that I had to sign that would say that I cannot disclose the client that I currently work for, but I do, you know, my, my paycheck, it comes from Eurofins. So I can, that one I can say. (laughs) Okay. All right. I don't want to get you into trouble. Yeah, no, 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 no. It's okay. I can, um, there are, are definitely proprietary things that that I am working on and have worked on that I can't exactly name, but we but I can definitely go into some of the specifics of what I do. I, I, I would love that because we didn't chat about this on the podcast. This is all new. I'm so excited. Correct. Actually, um, yep, I got a job. I got this position. Um, actually, I've had two different positions since we talked last. Oh, no, I was, okay. <laughs> I was working for AbbVie for um, for about four months. Um, they were in the process of a whole restructuring thing, and it just did not work out. Um, you know, no ill will one way or another, but it I couldn't stay there. So I ended up at uh, getting a call from Eurofins, and the rest is history. <laughs> so, without giving away too much, what do you what do you do there? What do you what do you use your chemistry for at this company? So I test mainly stability in medication. So I, t- I, you know, for for drugs that are going to market or have have recently gone to market, I make sure that they are shelf stable or things that need to be refrigerated. You know what what temperature it needs to be kept at to make sure that it is stable. I do um, a myriad of different tests to make sure that. Um, you know the 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 medication is effective as as we say it's effective and if you know if not we tweak the the lead chemist will go back and tweak the formula and then i run it to see where we are and then i go back and tell them like okay 
this is stable at this temperature for this amount of time or things like that. So most of my testing revolves around uh, HPLC. I do uh, a lot of uh, Carl Fisher testing as well, moisture testing, things like that. Okay, so like uh, you have some a drug for, I don't know, something, boils, something, <laughs> and if you're in a uh, humid area of North America, somebody like you has to check to make sure it doesn't wreck the drug um, and its effectiveness. Is that, am I on the right track? Yeah, something like that. Like, okay, well, um, I, don't, I don't know what I'm talking about. Please tell me if I'm wrong. <laughs> Well, okay, I can actually use a specific example. Not not that I worked on this, but oh, okay. uh, for instance, the uh, the coronavirus, um, the um, the vaccine, it, how you know they had to test to see that that is not stable at room temperature, and you had to you had to determine what the actual temperature it can go down to without mm. destroying any of the active ingredients and making sure that it is stable and then determining how long that is stable for. There's a whole myriad of testing that had to have gone into that. Oh. You know, and this has to be on, you know, regular ice or dry ice or maybe liquid nitrogen freezing, things like that. Yeah. Like one of it was Pfizer or Moderna. One of those had to be kept ultra cold. Do you, do you remember which one? Or maybe it was both of them. It was both of them. They need to be kept cold. Yes. They need yeah. to be kept very, very cold. You know, I need, I need, uh, if there, if I'm going to get another booster, I need the American Johnson and Johnson one. Cause then I'll have all four in my body and I'll be able to take over the world. Uh, <laughs> I'm I just collecting the different vaccines right now. So I somehow managed to only get Pfizer all three times. I was at different, I went to different How? locations. How did you I do that? I don't know. I swear I don't. I went to different locations. Um, I mean, I, I, I stay with the schedule, of the 30 days, but for some reason it was different times of the day. It, <laughs> somehow it was all Pfizer. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it was only Pfizer in around this area. No, I can't even say that. Cause my mom got Moderna. Okay. Cause you know what? I'm, I'm a fan of uh, Pokemon. So I just need one more and I'll have caught all of the vaccines. So. You, you should definitely seek that out. Do, do some <laughs> where, where Johnson and Johnson is going to be and like follow them around if there's another booster. Out. Yeah. I, well, it's, a, it's an American one, right? We didn't get the Johnson and Johnson in Canada. I think only limited places have it. Um, that's I'm just be, I'm being silly. So, Danielle, the other thing I want to talk about is you had a really cool presentation lately. Yes. So um, today my company is is a, we are a global company and we have locations in the UK. We have locations in Australia. We have uh, locations in India. And today we had a kind of a global symposium where uh, us and the UK got together and we did we did five different um presentations it was two people per presentation and it went out to all of our you know sister sites around the world mm -hmm. and so presentation we were talking about uh color testing which is surprisingly harder than people might think it is can you explain what that is i i, I have no idea sure so that's it's another uh stability test whereas um Color is is one of the um, byproducts of reactions, for instance. And if a reaction is progressing faster than it should be, it might it might elude a different color. So we have when we see these um, these these drugs, these medications that are a color that they're not supposed to be, we have to one test to confirm the the color because you know, like for instance, some blues and yellows. It might look like it's that color, but it's it's light enough or or somebody some people are just saying things. So first first and foremost, we test to see if that color is actually present in the sample. And then we use that as an indication of something could be wrong mm. or, hey, maybe something's going right. You know, if, if the combination is supposed to elude a color, then then we know that that things are happening as they're supposed to as they are supposed to happen. Gotcha. So this is one of the tests that I that I've been doing as well, and uh, it's 
it started off being a visible, a, a visual test where you might buy um, standards from whatever company and you can visually compare, the, you know, this this green to your sample to see is this, you know, is this green? Is this a darker green? Is it lighter? Is this okay? Is it bad kind of thing? We saw obviously that that is not a, a, a repeatable way to do it because what I see is green. Maybe you see is blue. Oh, or- you, this is fascinating, right? Because people perceive color completely differently. Absolutely. And, and, and not to mention the, like the depth of color if for instance if it's like a like a lighter color that might be okay that might be an acceptable um just stability test versus if it's a darker color now we now we're getting into the danger zone so you know where's that line we gotta we gotta make sure so we needed more of a objective way to test that so that was the presentation was about the the spectrophotometer that that we have and our co-partners in the UK have. And you, how run the, you run the sample through and you get the exact wavelength of the color. Is that, am I on the right track? Yes. Ah, yep, yep, yep. We, we have one of those at our school. We got a little teeny tiny one. Yeah. Ours is, well, I mean, it takes up about, it takes up about half our bench top. I, oh, I know that. Mine is of, the size of a, about a thumb. <laughs> Now that is tiny. <laughs> it, it, it's it's not super accurate. It's just there to help the kids see there's, yeah. Okay. Keep going. Sorry. I'm just excited that you have the same thing on a bigger scale that we have. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's, that, see, that's, what, that's one of the things that I really liked about, about science class is that a lot that you learn in science class really does translate to the real world. I mean, it, as obviously the scale might be different <laughs> and how you use it might be a little bit more accurate, but overall the testing is pretty much the same. Gotcha. And then of course, if you're running that through your, your spec meter, you get the exact wavelength of color. Thus, you know, you can't debate that if it's green or not, who cares? It's a wavelength, right? It's measurable with data. Exactly. And so the methods that we're, that we're running and we have, you know, you have your, um, your limits as to far as what wavelength indicates, so it indicates a problem. And so as long as we're below that particular wavelength, it's like, oh, okay. It's kind of a, it's interesting that this is eluding green for some reason, <laughs> but it's nothing, it's nothing concerning. Oh, kind of thing. Gotcha. It, it probably will be worth studying because this one's green and none of the other ones are. So why? But you know, it's, that's one of those. It's like, Oh, okay. Not a problem. We're going to keep an eye on it. But as of right now, it's not a problem. Were you presenting by zoom or like, was it virtual or were you in person? I know. Cause you were, you, you were sick today. Yes. Yeah. No, this was a team. It was always going to be a team because oh, okay. as a, it was presented to um, different places all around the world like uh we yeah, like i said we had somebody from australia dial in and mm. they had the best accent so whenever they ask questions i always spend more time focusing on the accent than the actual question oh did you hear that indra indra's in the indra's down there indra has the greatest australian accent australian <laughs> slash new zealand i love the the yeah, australia new zealand i just i love that accent <laughs> but, but so yeah we had to do it all the teams and it was actually kind of funny with um the coordinators, they they get get all the props for that because they had to send out all the different links to make sure that the presenters could unmute their mics and the ones who were just um who were just in there as as you know, listeners that they could not unmute their mics at all. They had to type out their questions if they wanted to say something, and uh, they also had to send out all the different time zones uh, because obviously us in America uh, are. <laughs> And we started at like seven this morning and the UK was at like three o'clock in this in the, in the afternoon in Australia. I have no idea what time it was over there. So they it's, like, it's like they're from the future. They right. Could, yeah. They're like from the next day. They're like, ha ha next day sucker. So. 
you know, you're right. I, I forgot about that that international dateline. Yeah. So theirs was, I guess, this presentation actually happened on Wednesday for them, <laughs> or really, really late at night. Right. One of the two. So, yeah. When I'm, um, I talked. I've talked to a bunch of guests from Australia, and that's the thing is I have to be careful when they say, when I give my time to them and they're like, oh, okay, well, it works for me at 9 a, nine a.m. And I'm like, oh, I can do 9 a.m. But they mean the next day. So then I have to go back a day and I've, I've messed up on a guest one time being off by an entire day just because it's the time zones are so weird. And see, now I had to, I, I'm a little bit anal retentive, so I had to double check yes. so many times. <laughs> yes for this today because i was like okay this is he's still he's giving me the time in mountain time central time is is different so it's actually 8 30 here so i love that i love that you picked up on the accents that's my favorite thing of talking to people from all over the world is i hear them t- hear them speak and i could just listen to people with different accents talk forever um and it doesn't matter where they're from i just love the accents people have that's not science related that's just a weird thing me related so <laughs> Um, okay. So the next question I have for you, uh, Oh, and let's, uh, let's do a quick reset as they say in, um, spaces speak. We are talking to Danielle Bush, who's a chemist. She works with a pharmaceutical company and we just kind of ran through what she does for her day job using chemistry to, uh, figure out the stability of chemicals slash drugs and color code them using wavelengths of light. It's almost like you're a Jedi, Danielle. That's, that sounds like some Star Wars babble speak right there. Um, but my, <laughs> by next, my next, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was saying we may or may not be working on a lightsaber. I cannot confirm nor deny. Really? No. <laughs> okay. Um, so Danielle, my other question for you is you, uh, you, bake like you love to bake and we ta- we talked uh, on the podcast you um do you still have a baking company because you had that as a side gig uh using the chemistry that uh, you, that you learned in your science training and applying it to the stuff that you make could you talk a little bit about that yes i do still have my baking company it's uh danny's decadent desserts i still run it i um i've been getting a lot less orders lately uh i think you know everyone's kind of getting back to quote unquote normal and going out to store bakeries so my business has been a little bit down lately but i still have it i am still making everything i make everything from cobblers to cookies and cakes cupcakes all kind of uh the fun baked goods and yes, I got into it really because of science, because of my passion for science. I love, I've always loved understanding how things work and why things work. And so the idea of baking was just kind of natural for me because it's, it is very science heavy. You know, you understand that baking soda, you know, is, is a base and how it works and then you have vinegar and it's an acid and how it works. And so, and, you know, you, you get that understanding of why this tastes good. Why chocolate, for instance, um, you know, chocolate was, was designed to, to melt at, uh, and yes, I am going to use the American version here is chocolate melts r- roughly about, you know, 96 degrees. <laughs> Fahrenheit. And the human body is about 98 degrees Fahrenheit. So literally, that's why chocolate melts in your hand. But that's also why it is so sumptuous, because it is it it has that melty quality built into it. And so I love learning things like that. That <clears throat> I never thought of it that way, that it, it melts because it's the same temperature is basically or it melts at the same temperature that we exist at. Yeah. Mm hmm. But then, and, and even that is is scientifically designed um, because of the amount of of you know of, of of fat that goes into chocolate. Because because you know if you do if you do the experiment and yes I have done this experiment if you take different amounts of chocolate the different uh, dark chocolate milk chocolate white chocolate the different uh, amounts of cocoa they will all have different melting temperatures as well because of the fat content in them, the cocoa butter content in them. 
Is there is there a chocolate that doesn't melt great? Like, do you do you know off the top of your head? I don't know. Sorry to put you on the spot. Um, white chocolate is not the greatest, uh, mostly because <laughs> the cocoa in it. It's not really chocolate, I guess. It's not really chocolate, exactly. Um, but really, the the rule of thumb is the higher the fat content, the more it's going, to, the easier it's going to melt. Okay. Now, Chris, do you want to share your story about white chocolate? I don't know if you're listening. You might be dealing with Bunsen and Beaker. Um, I will share my story about white chocolate. I think white chocolate is disgusting um, because we bought it in, um, I don't know, it's like a bulk aisle um, at the store um, in those bins that I'm sure um, have mouse poo in them. I'm sure. I'm sure of it. Um, But there was the white chocolate bark in there, almond bark, I think it's called or something. And I was drawing on the road with it like chalk. And then I would draw a little bit on the road and then I would take a little nibble and then I would draw some more on the road and nibble again. Why did I do that? Why, if I could just go back and tell my 10 year old self, like that's not a good idea, I would, but that's what I was doing. And I ate it and then I made myself sick. And now I just, every time I think of it, I think of the road and I drew on the road and then ate it. Ugh. Good thing I lived in a suburb of Vancouver where it rained all the time, so I'm sure the roads were very clean. No. <laughs> I think it's because yeah. you got asphalt on it. I don't think you're supposed to eat asphalt, Chris. I don't think I'm supposed to do what I did, but you know what? I'm okay. I, I survived. You know, I don't mind white chocolate. I, I don't like it. I, <laughs> I'm outnumbered. I'm outnumbered. <laughs> <laughs> um danielle i put your uh the link to your website up in the nest so um up in the nest folks there's a link to danielle's website when we talked on the podcast you shipped up some of your cobblers and oh my goodness were they good um so i can vouch for just how amazing <laughs> your stuff is danielle um i know it's a ways to ship to canada but i think your rates of shipping are are not are great around your area right um or do you ship all over North America? I forget. So I do. Um, I ship all over this country um, with because I use the uh, flat rate boxes, so I could do a flat rate for shipping all around this country. Um, Canada and Mexico would be very different. Um, that one I haven't done much research into shipping. Uh, short of you shipping you your order, I have not shipped outside of the country. But um, anyone in the Chicagoland area, I have a 10, I believe it is 10 miles on my on my website. It's automatic that if you are within 10 miles of my location, that shipping is free because I do offer delivery. Nice. Now, I have a, qu- a baking question for you. Uh-huh. Okay. So are some of your recipes like your own creations or are they like, are they like generational, like from passed down from ages ago, like your mom and your grandma like that is, is, or is it a mixture? It's a, it's a pretty good mixture. Um, there are two main ones that have been passed down. Um, my peach cobbler is, my grandmother's recipe that passed to my dad that I that I now use, and there is my um, my sweet potato crumble, which was, you know, I don't remember where my mom got it from initially, but she passed it to me. So, so those- a sweet potato, say that again, a sweet potato crumble, sweet potato crumble. So it's uh, if you. I don't <laughs> so, see. I think that you put potatoes in a thing. Is that what's what we're talking about here? <laughs> see, this is this is where the differences between our country really become kind of kind of uh, prevalent because in the South here in the South, um, Mississippi and uh, and Georgia places like that, instead of doing pumpkin pie, we do sweet potato pie. Really. <laughs> Yes. Is it and, good? Is it good? I guess like pumpkin isn't sweet. Yeah. See, personally, I don't like pumpkin pie at all. Um, I've never liked the punk the flavor of pumpkin. 
Okay. Growing up, um, I know I'm, I'm from Chicago, but my family is from the South. Um, my my dad's family is from Mississippi, like the heart of Mississippi. And my aunts were really ones who kind of who kind of taught me how to cook. So I I say I'm from Chicago, but my my love of cooking is Southern. And so that's where the like the like the peach cobbler and the and the sweet potato and that's all that's all notes to my southern roots and yeah so basically it's kind of that same texture and it it really is a similar color but the Mm. flavor is much different because yeah as you said pumpkin isn't naturally sweet sweet potato is i want to try this now i want to (laughs) try a sweet potato pie i've never even heard of that um yeah so this crumble, it's it's got a uh, um, graham cracker and brown sugar crust, and then the sweet potato filling, which is a family secret. So I can't tell you, but uh, <laughs> it's topped with with more of the of the crust to give it that that crumble effect. It's actually one of my more popular sellers. Wow. Okay. Chris, should we try making some sweet potato pie? You like Chris is a huge fan of sweet potatoes. Huge fan. I like fan. sweet potatoes. We could try it. Okay. I don't know. But you know what? Canadians eat weird stuff too, Chris. Like I'm thinking sweet potato pie. That sounds kind of weird. But then if you look at your own thing that you eat, you're like, oh my God, what's a what's poutine? Like it's like fries with gravy and cheese. Like what the heck is that even? You guys will never sell me on that one. Not- <laughs> Or uh, or the, what do the Quebec what do the Quebecois have? They have that maple syrup on a stick with snow. Yeah. Have you had it here? That's a, that's actually not bad. That's super yummy. To be honest with you, what, what is the what is the name of that, Chris? In French, uh, la tire, t i r e, r r e e, yeah, la tire. Okay, I'll okay. call it le sweet stick. That's what I'm going to call it. <laughs> Okay, call it sweet stick. <laughs> That's pretty good. Uh, okay. Um, I Sorry, I'm derailing the conversation. You know what? I like talking about food, to be honest with you. I love talking about food. Um, I'm, I'm okay with it. I'm a baker. I, I love talking about food as well. <laughs> um, okay. Outside, I have one more food question for you, Danielle. Um, mm-hmm. Okay. So outside of the stuff that you bake. What yes. is a decadent dessert that you would eat that you would like? Like, you're like, oh, that is just oh, chef's kiss. Because from one baker to another, is there something somebody else makes that's really good or some other treat? I'm just curious. Hmm. You know what I always love to eat that I am too terrified to even attempt making is uh, macaroons. Oh, macaroons. They are good. They are just so very good and are so very delicate and when they're made correctly they're just they're amazing okay. and i am so terrified of attempting to because i don't think that i can make them correctly <laughs> <laughs> they th- yeah because if you don't they fall apart or they don't set right they're like little ticking time bombs exactly so yeah and and each piece has to be or each part of it has to be made perfectly both the cookies the filling all of it has to be perfect and then it has to be assembled perfectly and it's just it's a lot i love to eat them uh, but uh, i love going to the stores to go get them though (laughs) have you ever had a butter tart have you heard of a butter tart before that's a canadian sweet treat um describe it we might have an american version of it okay i'll describe it as a canadian comedian describes it so if you take sex and gold and put it in a blender you get a butter tart that's what a butter tart is (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> sex and gold huh well yeah. um you have to google I, image uh, you know what i'll put i'll tweet about a butter tart and then i'll put it in the <laughs> nest for everybody to take a look at uh but they are they are one of my favorite treats yeah i'll have to look that up i i have not heard of those we have butter cookies but those are those are probably completely different <laughs> butter cookies yeah i've heard of those you we ice those at christmas time yeah Yep, yep. We can have them iced. Um, <clears throat> we mostly ice sugar cookies. Sugar because, cookies, yeah, yeah. There we go. Sugar cookies. Yeah, I mean, we do. We can do both because you know Americans are nothing if not gluttons. So <laughs> why not? Yeah, why not? And then add bacon. That's then. That's what the Canadians would be doing. 
<laughs> That's what Bunsen would be doing. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so I'm I've uh, tweeted out the butter tart. It's just oh, I've got Twitter blue, so it just takes a second. I'm just gonna force it through, um, and then I'll put that in the nest. Oh no, I can't do that from desktop. Get get it together, Twitter. I've got to jump back and forth from my phone to my computer. Okay, one second here. Uh, all right, I've put the butter tart up in the nest. It's a recipe for the best Canadian butter tarts. I don't know. I'm not plugging this. It's just a, it's a picture of it. Um, you can have raisins in it uh, if you want. I, I prefer them with raisins. Chris will say raisins are the absolute worst thing to put in any food. Um, I hate raisins. I hate them. They're terrible. They're disgusting. I, I think there's probably an American analog to a butter tart, but anyways. <laughs> Honestly, I feel like raisins have their place, but overall, I kind of agree with Chris. I, <laughs> people try too many people try and put raisins in everything. Like, uh, give me an oatmeal raisin cookie. I'm happy. Other than that, raisins are are they don't need to be in anything. <laughs> Really? You don't look at that cookie and go, oh, I wish it was chocolate chip and oatmeal? And then you're sadly disappointed if you find raisins in it? Actually, oatmeal raisin cookie is probably, and it's so funny because I don't like oatmeal and I don't really like raisins, but oatmeal raisins cookies are probably one of my favorite cookie. I'm weird like that. I can't explain it. I don't know, but (laughs) it is what it is. Do you think like it's just like the texture where it's like so soft, probably from the raisin and the oatmeal together? Yeah, I I think that it, that it, that possibly contributes to it. Um, I am a really big texture eater. If it if if a food has a weird texture, I I won't eat it. Me either. Absolutely not. It will just be like <laughs> I that will not go in my mouth. That is not going to go in there. Chris, you have so much in common with Danielle. This is hilarious. I know. I just love you're her. bonding I just over love the you, Danielle. Hate you're of so raisins. cool. Like I just love how your your science career, but then yet you are flourishing in your um baking career i just love it it's like a combo (laughs) i try um i lost what i was gonna say oh i I trolled uh, my students a couple years ago pre-covid um i had a small group of students that were was coming in i bought a bunch of oatmeal raisin cookies from tim hortons and then I told them they were chocolate chip just to see how long it took them to realize that it wasn't chocolate chip. And like a couple of the kids were so polite there. I was watching them just ate them and they're like, oh. you could see their face was like, oh man, this is not what he said. And then <laughs> one of the other kids was like, hey, this isn't chocolate chip. But the other kids were just so polite. They ate them without saying. So anyways, I thought that was kind of funny. Um, <laughs> That's so Canadian. <laughs> it is. It is. So before we open up the floor to questions, Danielle, could you talk a little bit about uh, your pets or a pet? Because um, we, we do like to let our guests uh, chat about their pets in their life. Yes, I have two dogs and a snake. Um, you have a snake? I do have a snake. Yes. His name is Peanut. He's named after one of my favorite Bears players. And uh, he, I always compare him to like a cat without legs, because if you think of a cat, like knocking things off the table, having an attitude, only being, <laughs> you know, only being cuddly when they want to be cuddly, like that is my snake. I swear. <laughs> but yes, I have uh, two dogs and I'm actually surprised that they are relatively quiet during this. Usually when I'm in some form of meeting, they decide that they want to be part of the meeting as well. But uh, they're asleep right now. They are litter mates. They, um, the shelter that I got them from said that they are um, fox terrier mixes. And one dog, Zeus, he actually does look like a smooth coat fox terrier. But Duke looks a lot like a beagle. So I think that they have beagle mixed into them as well. I really don't care enough to, to try and get them DNA tested. <laughs> They are they are love bugs. Whatever whatever Aww. breed they, are, very lovable, very cuddly. I'm gonna put a couple pictures of them up in the nest. Um, what's the picture with three of them together? Because you said you had two. Um, yeah, that's so. From, that's from the January, March, April. Yeah, so the 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 brown fluffy one that is Gizmo. That is my mom's dog. Oh, okay, um, all right. Yeah, there's many, many times because uh, me and my mom, me and my parents, we live, I think, 
I timed myself one time and it took 16 minutes to get from my house to her house. So we live very, very close to each other. And there's a lot of times that um, we'll go to the dog parks or I'll take them or my mom will come and pick them up and take them for a walk if I'm working or vice versa. So, you know, the, the three, they get along very, very well. They spend time together pretty much every week I go over to the house. Aww. They're so they, happy, Danielle. <laughs> Yeah, I think that picture was either us going to or just coming from the dog park. <laughs> oh, no, there's one of them barking together. What's going on there? They're barking. The best ori- Yeah, best original song, Terrier Howl. I just, oh, put, I just put that in the nest for people to take a look at. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I always joke that, that because they are beagles, they have that spirit of beagle where they want to bay and they want to howl. Oh, yeah. But- they have the voices of terriers, which is high, very high pitched, very screechy, very. <laughs> um, my mom describes Zeus's howl as it sounds like his tail got stuck in a blender because it sounds like he's screaming almost. Oh. He's happy. He is, you know, this is he loves it. He loves doing it. But it sounds like if you were to close your eyes, it sounds like he is in pain. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Doc barks like that. That's, uh, my father-in-law's little, uh, oh, what is a miniature schnauzer? He's got a a bark that sounds like he's sometimes in pain, but that's just the way he sounds. Yeah, right. I actually was afraid, um, a few years ago, I was still, I was still living in an apartment and sometimes if I would, if I would leave, you know, right around the time that I would uh, I would start coming back home. But if, for instance, I was late, because I, I swear my dogs can tell time. So if I was like a half hour, or hour late from coming home from work, they started howling. And I was so afraid that my neighbors would, would like get me evicted. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> like th- this is not a subtle sound when they when they're going. And they, they always get each other going. Like one might start and then the other one would join in and they'll just keep goading each other. Like one might want to stop, but since the other one's going to keep going, they'll they'll both just keep going. Yeah, Beaker is like that. If Bunsen's barking, Beaker won't even check why. She'll just start barking. She just tr- <laughs> trusts him implicitly that it, there's a reason to bark. Where if Beaker's barking, Bunsen will go over and like, what are you doing? And then most of the time, if there's nothing, because it's just Beaker being Beaker, like, oh, I'm going to bark at the light or at a leaf that's blowing outside. Bunsen will just go back to sleep. He's like, oh, kids. <laughs> but if it's something kind of important, he'll start barking. That's when we get worried. We're like, okay, he's barking now. Something is definitely up. He's kind of the litmus test for seriousness. Oh, yeah. See, I don't have one of those. They'll both just bark at a leaf. There's and- nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we're at the point where we can take some questions from the audience for Danielle, the Q&A part. Um, If you'd like to request the mic to ask a question about uh, Danielle's job as a chemist or making maybe a baking question, Danielle's super knowledgeable about football. We didn't even get into that, but I swear on the podcast we talked about football for like 45 minutes and I learned so much. Um, (laughs) We talked about Aaron Rodgers uh, as well, I think for about 10 minutes. Um, so we got some people coming up to ask some questions. And again, I do like if you are, uh, if your account is locked or I'm not sure who you are, you may not get up to the stage. Um, and that's just because I have full control about who I bring up. Okay. We'll go to Indra and then to Paula. Hello, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever everybody is. Uh, it's thank you so much for holding this space. Uh, to Chris and Jason, and um, it's lovely to hear uh, Danielle. I was I was really just um, enjoying a lot of the baking stories. I just want to digress quickly to something that Chris was sharing um, about <laughs> about the um, the white chocolate uh, on the road. And all I could think of, I was laughing because not at the <laughs> at, at what had happened but I was thinking of if I wondered if Donna was in the space because I was just thinking oh my gosh she must be putting together a myriad of diseases in her head at this time <laughs> Food right? safety Donna Craig no she's on the yes. job right now she's not here 
Oh, yeah, because I, yeah, I was looking. I went I went scanning to see if she was in the room. I thought, oh, my gosh, is Donna here? She'd have, like, at least 50 different possibilities. <laughs> um, so anyway, I, I really... <laughs> I, I that really gave me a laugh just the concept of that um and then um it's actually uh Australian British accent not New Zealand Jason so oh just, I'm sorry that's okay that's that is absolutely okay because I'm here to confuse all Americans and Canadians of course sorry <laughs> so. Indra I do love your accent though <laughs> it's, but, great accent. it's absolutely a great accent <laughs> thank you so much but um but now um over to um our special guest in the space. I was curious because, I mean, I am a baker and actually, uh, and I do like to cook. It's, it's like, um, it's like a stress relief for me. I wondered if it's relaxing for you as well, like when you bake or when you cook, if it is something that is sort of, you know, a way that you can just send out, put some music on. I was just curious. Absolutely. It is. Um, I actually have, um, <laughs> orders from my, well, not orders, but uh, I have medical suggestion from my therapist that I do need to bake more because it is very much a a stress relief and it does help with my anxiety. Um, I absolutely love just putting on music and singing and dancing very badly in my kitchen. I love that, Danielle, so much because I often, well, I sort of joke that I dance in my kitchen, but it could be a reality. (laughs) (laughs) So um, good to hear that uh, I'm not alone. Um, Even though I am alone in my kitchen, there's others (laughs) dancing in their kitchen too. Um, Could I, do I have time for one quick follow-up question, Jason? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Yeah. As long as you're feeling well enough to answer, Danielle, we we usually run for about an hour. You okay, Danielle? I'm good. Yep. Okay. Okay. This one is actually, I'm just curious because I, I know that you um, you mentioned, talked about baking, but do you actually also enjoy cooking savory dishes? And if you do, what's your favorite to cook? I do enjoy cooking savory. Um, my favorite to cook, um, honestly, I don't necessarily have a favorite dish, but I, weird enough, I do have a favorite protein. Like I love cooking pork because I love how versatile it is. I can do... Um, any, I can do a bunch of different things with pork. I feel like I can be creative, both breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And so that is probably my favorite protein to cook. But as far as my favorite dish, I don't really have one. Hey, what do you think of what I did um, when I was first trying to woo Jason? I bought pork chops and I... Uh, read on an internet article. Now you got to keep in mind, like Jason and I were together pretty much before Google. Um, <laughs> and I put it in what? Apple juice, apple juice. I marinated it in apple juice and then I cooked it. And you said it was the best thing you've ever eaten. Jason, do you remember this? I would say anything about anything you cooked because I, I, I really <laughs> wanted to spend time with you, but I do believe, <laughs> I do believe those pork chops were divine because they were cooked by an angel. Oh, okay. Anyway, what do you think of my marinade? Um, apple juice. <laughs> it's yeah, I've done it before. I've done um well, I haven't done just apple juice. I usually will uh do different spices and um usually if you have a um an acid with it too, it helps it, it helps kind of break down the uh the meat fibers and allow the marinade to kind of soak in a little deeper so that it keeps its moisture while cooking. So I usually do uh, just a splash of apple cider vinegar as well. But yeah, I absolutely do apple juice too, because yeah, apples and pork go very well together. Oh, I'm so hungry for more apple juice pork chops now. Well, I made them again and you said they weren't as good as the first time. So what? yeah, I think you did. I think you said, I think that's because that's because you're married to me. You're stuck now. (laughs) great um uh peaceful warrior you you have your hand up but did you want to interject on the conversation or or can you wait uh in the queue if you if you have a quick comment go ahead if not we'll go to paula just you have your hand up uh oh yes um i do have a question for danielle okay Mm -hmm. would you would you uh would you mind waiting we've just got a kind of an order is that okay Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, if you've got a, like a, a comment to go with what we're talking about, we don't mind if you jump in. But if it's like a question unrelated, we'll just we'll just wait the queue. Um, I think Paula is next, and then Doctor M, and then uh, we'll go to Peaceful after that. So Peaceful, you're third, if that's okay. Go ahead, Paula. Hi, good evening, everybody. Hi, Danielle. It's nice to have you. My gosh, I think I'm with Endra and everybody. I I am a big, huge baker, and I love to cook. So I'm, but baking is my true love, man. I could just talk hours about this <laughs> for sure. I could but- talk to Danielle for like seven hours. She's so cool. Oh, I know it, and 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 I hope you feel better. I'm so I'm so sorry you're not feeling well with COVID. That that's that's awful. But um, keep baking. It's it it, it is it is a stress relief. But um, I'm trying to think what butter tarts are like. Would it be almost like the filling of maybe a pecan pie? You know, like that sugary kind of substance in a tart form. With I don't know, is there maple syrup in there too, Jason? I'm not sure, but. They are they're very um, kind of gooey like that, so it has that kind of sugary base to it. That's what my best analogy. Probably <laughs> the sugar. I haven't. Had, I'm gonna make them one of these days. I oh, swear. you're gonna but, get ad- oh. you're gonna get addicted. There's oh, nothing I'm addicted like to sugar, baby. Anyway, so <laughs> nothing's gonna stop me. But <laughs> but anyway, I wanted to ask you, Danielle, what is your what is the most challenging thing you've ever baked? Um, because do you ever do cakes or torts or do you just stay with uh, your pies and stuff? And yes, sweet potato pies, I agree, are so wonderful compared to pumpkin. But, um, you know, I'm just wondering if there was something that you really, really haven't, you know, have done or want to attempt. I know macaroons are tough. That would be meringue is a tough puppy to work with. But um I just wondered, you know, what you have you ever done cakes or anything, you know, what's your favorite thing to make? Okay. Um, so first things first, thank you for, for putting that image in my mind. So now I have a general idea of what uh, at least the consistency of a butter tart, because I know what a pecan pie is. And <laughs> yeah, those, that's my dad's favorite kind of pie. So so I can kind of imagine what that what that is now. So thank you for that. Um but yes, I do cakes. I do um, I do cakes for sale. I also do most of my cakes are commissions from my friends and family for birthdays, things like that. Um, I probably the most challenging cake I made was a German chocolate cake, and I and I did all the uh, toasted coconut on the side, and I absolutely that's one of the things that I like the least about decorating cakes is trying to put uh like coconut or even ground nuts and things on the side of cake i have not figured out how to do that without making a complete mess yet <laughs> hopefully i can with more practice i can figure out how to how to do oh, that with i like, can give you a real good tip if you just slide if you don't mind real quick i'll just slide some like uh parchment or wax underneath your cake and take a really big handful of those chopped nuts or coconut and almost like fling it, whack it on the side of the cake without coming close to that frosting. I mean, y- y- you'll catch it in the, in the, in the paper that's below the cake. So it, it, it sounds like daunting, but if you have it sticking out far enough, because believe me, I've made so many cakes in my life, but it, it's like, it, it, you almost have to like fling it at the side of the cake. It's almost like those confetti nonpareils you get that, you know, they go everywhere too. So um, but that's my little tip for you. And, and boy, <laughs> sometimes we could DM forever, I swear. But I, I'm looking at your website drooling. You you just look it's, like you have a marvelous. I am it's, so hungry. Oh. I was like searching for it and I was like, oh, oh man, this was a mistake. It is awesome, <laughs> awesome. And and just to just to close, because I know you got a lot in queue here, but I just played that video of your howling pooches, and that is hysterical. That's hilarious. They are it is the funniest thing I've ever seen in this. It's, it's like a howling screech. <laughs> it's so bad. It's, oh, it's, so it's so joyful. Thank you so much. And then, like I said, uh, you know, good luck with the baking. And, and anytime you want to talk, just DM me because I, I talk with you for an hour on it, I swear. <laughs> I'm definitely going to take that tip of, of, of using the, the wax paper. Thank you for that. I, had, I don't know why I never even thought about that. That's, that is a great tip. Thank you. No, you're quite welcome. I would have suggested loading the nuts and or coconut in a potato cannon and blasting that at the side of the cake. But that's because I'm in a more on the explosive side of chemistry expert. So anyways, you might not have a cake after, but it should be fun. 
I have tried to hold the uh like a like a mini um like a personal fan and just kind of putting it <laughs> in front of the fan and turning the fan on, letting the fan blow it. It it didn't work out. But it got <laughs> what the cake. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Okay, over to Dr. M. Hi everyone. Hi Danielle. Thank you so much for sharing everything you're sharing with us. Um just, you know, for the record, everyone's so excited over the baking, but I find you super cool for uh, being a chemist. Um, and my question is um, whether there is um, a kind of chemistry that you like more than others or um, or not. A kind of chemistry that I like, you mean like analytical chemistry kind of sure. thing? Sure, like organic, you know, I guess the, reg the, the regular chemistry would be like inorganic chemistry, but I'm just wondering if like you like organic, inorganic, or like, you know, peak physical chemistry, or, you know, I guess analytical, those are actually the only ones I can think of at the moment, or, um, or do you not have a preference? Um... I think as far as the one that you've listed, I think analytical is far and away my favorite. I, as I said, I like under, I like understanding how and why things work. And I think that analytical gives me more of a hands-on um, understanding of, of chemistry in a, in a way that, that I can take it in easier. Um, orgo, you know, everything is organic, right? So it's, mm -hmm. It's one of those things that is necessary, but it's definitely not my favorite. And uh, physical chemistry, no. I, I run screaming away from physical chemistry. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm right there with you on, on the physical chemistry. Um, that's cool. Um, analytical chemistry, awesome, awesome. Um, I always I found that to be you know the more the more difficult ones. Um, that's awesome. Um, yeah, uh, way to go. I think you're super cool for the chemistry. Um, the baking, of course. I mean, how can you not like baking? But um, <laughs> but everyone seems to be purely excited about the baking, and I haven't heard them say anything about chemistry. So. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I wanted to ask you about chemistry. I appreciate that. I think that the uh, the baking it tends to be a little bit more of the showstopper since it's chemistry that you can eat. And, <laughs> you know, everyone has a sweet tooth to, to some degree. <laughs> oh, gosh, um, Ed, that's amazing. I never thought of it as chemistry that you can eat, but so true. Yeah. <laughs> that's why they call people who make meth cooks. <laughs> Be eating oh wait i shouldn't have said that i'm sorry that was my inside voice in my head um, <laughs> um today with my um my chem 30 students they're like the the last grade before they graduate kids i've got such a fun group of kids um we we're in the end of the organic chemistry unit part of their curriculum and we made esters today and that was so fun so it's like you mix a carboxylic acid and an alcohol together and it makes a smelly chemical um, and it's a lot of fun, uh, for me as a teacher, but then it's practical for them, right? Cause a lot of organic chemistry is like drawing and picturing things in your head. Um, but this stuff was kind of cool. Anyways, one group went rogue and they mixed things they weren't supposed to, and they made an ester that smelled like gym socks. So <laughs> I don't know if I should fail them or congratulate them, but it was the worst. The whole lab <laughs> smelled like gym socks and, and they were very proud it was like a group of three girls. And they're like, look what we made. And it was just gagging everybody around them. Anyways, sigh. Um, okay. Over to, <laughs> over to peaceful warrior and then CC. Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, I, I was um, going to ask the question um, and forgive me if, if, if it's already been answered. Uh, I've been multitasking tonight. <laughs> Um, do you, Danielle, do you, uh, approach, um, your baking from the standpoint of, uh, like almost like, uh, analytical or whatever, do you think about chemistry as you're baking? You know, if you're using vinegar, okay, that's a, uh, an acid, uh, you know, like in, in terms of the, you know, periodic tables or, <laughs> or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Um, Yes and no. Um, if I if I am trying out a new recipe or if I'm in if I'm experimenting, trying to develop a new recipe. Absolutely. I think about what you know, how much of this do I need to get 
the rise that I'm looking for? How much of this do I need to like um we talked last time on the on the podcast about about how salt um acts in a like in a cake recipe, how it's not there's not enough salt in order to make something salty, but there's enough salt to kind of increase the flavors of other things. So I'll think about like, I know I need X amount of salt in order to make, you know, to get my desired reaction. Absolutely. When I'm, when I'm trying a new recipe, however, some of, a lot of the things I'm on my website, for instance, I've made so many times that I don't even really think about that anymore. It's more of a autopilot. I just kind of go in the kitchen and I know this, 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 put it in the oven and I get what I, (laughs) I get the desired effect. Got it. Thank you. Um, do, uh, just one other quick question. Have you ever made scones? And if so, do you have a good scone recipe? Thank you. You know, I made scones one time. They were orange glazed scones. Um, personally, I don't think that they turned out very well. They were very, very dense. Um, and I kind of threw them away and pretended like I never attempted them. <laughs> Yeah, sort of like <laughs> from scones to stones. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if it was like I overmixed them. Maybe I put too much. I don't know what it was, but they those things were hockey pucks, and right. I was not impressed at all. <laughs> all right, thank you very much. I kind of feel like the oiler should have been playing with those scones. Yeah, uh, honestly, they probably could have. <laughs> uh, okay, well, great. That's a great question. Uh, peaceful warrior. Um, Danielle, I, I kind of know the answer to this, uh, but I was, I said I would ask this anyways. Uh, Melinda asked in chat, um, not in chat. I'm, ho- I'm waiting for the little chat feature. Some people have on the bottom, right? We don't have it yet, but, uh, they DM me, um, Melinda DM me. Do you sell some of your recipes or do you sell recipes or, or not? I do not. Okay. Um, I've had anyone ask me over for them before. Okay. Um, Melinda, DM Danielle and see what she says about that. Then, <laughs> yeah, I, I think I'd be open to, to to doing it, but yeah, no, I've never had anyone even ask me about that before. <laughs> okay, all right, so that that question's answered. All right, over to Cece. Hi, Cece, do you got a question? Yeah, hi. Um, I'll be quick because we know we're getting towards the hour. Um, thanks so much for taking my question. Um, I was wondering, um. Uh, if you had anything, sorry to continue on the baking front, um, that you found most stress relieving to bake, is there like a particular kind of thing? I know people sometimes find bread really relaxing because they can like knead out all their frustration or (laughs) things like that. And, um, and, uh, scones are actually some of my favorite things to make. Um, and there are a lot of really great recipes, um, from a variety of different food blogs, but if you just Google like scone recipe, um, you will find a host of them and they're pretty easy to follow. So hope that helps. Well, first of all, I would have to get over my embarrassment of how bad I did the first time I made scones. <laughs> but um, anything that I find particularly relaxing to make, um, I do, I really do enjoy making bread. Yes, the kneading part of it is very uh, relaxing, is yeah, taking out your frustration on bas- basically banging the bread down onto the cutting board and punching it. Yes, that, that <laughs> definitely does. Um, but honestly, I think probably one of the most relaxing things I like to make are are my pies. I um I make the the crust by hand, and just kind of watching it come together, and and allowing it to rest. And then I still have the the not so much kneading, but rolling it out and everything is still the, I can get my frustration out on that. And just the the final product always looks that that nice golden brown sheen on it and everything it always just looks so pretty so i think pies are probably one of my uh most relaxing things that i bake all right did that that answer your question cc we're good i did thank you all right okay um, I've brought Samantha up. Uh, I think we'll we'll take one more question and then we'll we'll shut her down. Are you still feeling okay, Danielle, to take a question? Yep, I'm still good. Okay. Hi, Samantha. Good to see you. Do you have a question? 
Yeah, I was just wondering, Danielle, have you done any studies on on the relation between kneading bread and stress relief? Because I've read a few things about that correlation, and uh, I was I heard you talking about it. I was like, I got to come up and ask about it. Have you done any any extra work, any extra pursuit of information about that? Um. As a, a, like in a professional scientific route, no, I have plenty of anecdotal stories about it. I, I, from me, from, from, like I said, my aunts kind of taught me how to cook and they tell me all the time that baking biscuits are one of the most uh, Zen like things that they do. And so, yeah, anecdot- anecdotally, sure. I've, I've still talked to a few people who, who, who have that correlation of baking breads and relaxation, but, um, the, uh, the psychology of it, kind of the, the, the study of, of, you know, of the brain and all, and all that kind of stuff, that's not really my area of, of expertise. So I can say that, no, I have not professionally done too many studies that way. I've looked, I mean, I can look them up. I can, I'm sure I can Google that. We yeah, I probably could too, but you were so passionate about it that I was hoping to hear more. But honestly, just what you said was just scientific enough because you experimented and had a result. And so you can report on that. And that's good enough for me. So thanks for sharing that. It was just a good reminder of how important it is for us to physically release stress. So uh, thanks very much for your interview. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I, I definitely... Um, you know, kind of going back to the anecdotal part, I, I mentioned earlier that uh, I do have a therapist that has told me that uh, baking is obviously something that that really does help with my anxiety. And so she because at one point I wasn't doing it. I didn't have time to, to bake as much as I would have liked to. And she told me she's like, you, you really need to make time for that because it, it helps me so much. So doctor's orders so I have been baking a lot more <laughs> We did, uh, we looked at a study early on in the podcast, uh, in our podcast history. I found it again, Danielle. So from the Journal of Positive Psychology in 2016, they did a study and they found that hobbies and like baking, if they, if you consider baking a hobby, I know for you, it's a business, business, um, hobbies that require methodic, repetitive, um, tasks increase your mindfulness. So you're more present. So your anxiety goes down because you're not worried about the future and you're not thinking about the past. So that's probably like the needing aspect of it is it's methodical and it's repetitive. Um, now I don't bake, but with my cosplay, I have to do a lot of sanding. (laughs) This is going to sound terrible, but I've grown to love sanding stuff so much because I've got to make it super smooth and get out all of because I 3d print stuff. So you got to sand out all the layer lines. And I, that's probably why I like it. Is it for me, it's a stress relief. That's so weird. That makes perfect sense to me. Um, yeah. Anything that you have that, that kind of a passion for, and if you can, um, that put your passion in and, and yeah, get that, the scientific repetitiveness that, 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 releases those chemicals in your brain it absolutely makes sense that that you know that's what that's what will help each person to have their stress relief obviously it's it's different for every person but if you find it then that's great yeah one thing i love is adam likes to bake and he'll say let's bake cookies mom and i'm like oh what but it's that building community with him and spending that time with him doing something methodical and this is the next thing and just you know we're working together and communicating without talking we're just building and we're just being and that's what I love about that part yeah that actually reminds me it's it's a quick story here um at the uh at the beginning of of lockdown um me and my mom would do zoom calls and I, you know, I would, we would, I would tell, I would send out like a recipe to her every week and then we would get together on Friday and, uh, we get a glass of wine each and then we would be on zoom baking whatever recipe together. And I would, you know, I would tell her, okay, you got to do it this way. You got to do it that way. And (laughs) 
<laughs> she's she's gonna kill me for telling for telling people this, but it never hers never showed it never came out the way mine did, and I don't know why because apparently we're doing the exact same steps, but <laughs> I don't know what it, whatever it was that she would do that I didn't do or whatever, but it was it was really nice to to still have that connection even you know at the the height of the pandemic. So whenever I tried to explain things to kids on zoom, they just turned their cameras off. So maybe I should have done some baking. <laughs> well, I think, I think the wine helped too. <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe that would have helped me deal with it better too, with teaching over zoom. Just kidding. Illegal. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Danielle, thank you so much for being a guest tonight. This, uh, it's such a treat when we get to chat. Um, we didn't get to talk about sports. That would be a whole other show, I think, of you just schooling me on American football because uh, I knew nothing and now I know more, which is great. <laughs> yeah, uh, I could easily talk for many hours about football. So your team is the Bears, the Chicago Bears? Yes. Unfortunately, my team is the Bears. Okay. And then- is the Bears the one that had the refrigerator? Yes, Refrigerator Perry. Um, yeah, that was. Back. Who is this person, Chris? Did you just come up with a sports thing? I did. Yes, Refrigerator Perry. He was on a commercial. I think he was affiliated with Coke. Jason, this has got to be um, twenty-five years ago, thirty years ago. I would say. Yeah, yeah, he was a bit before my time. Oh my. That's the only one I know. Okay. And Aaron Rodgers. And Tom Brady. Those are the only ones. Well, you need Danielle's help then. <laughs> <laughs> I think you need her help. I came up with a refrigerator of Perry and knew he was a cub. Jason, that's two for two. Yeah, I did not know that. I've never heard of this person before in my life. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, Danielle, thank you so much for being our, our guest tonight. Uh, so appreciate it. Thank you to everybody who came up to talk to uh and uh, ask questions. I'm just going to close out the space. There we go. One more time. Give Danielle some love in the chat. Claps. Hearts. Um, peace Thank signs. You, there we go. Thank uh, you, Bull. Yeah, you're, you rock, Danielle. We with you, wish you nothing but the best. And let us know how your job's going. Uh, if you if you got some new deets to give us, we'd love to know. Uh, <laughs> and please, please get better. Please, oh, yes. please stay healthy and get better. Yes, that too. Yes. Um, don't forget, every Saturday we have Pet Chat at 6 o'clock. It's where our community gathers to talk dogs, cats, snakes, I guess, sometimes birds. We play some games and we have a sponsor that gives a, gives a prize. Um, Danielle was our guest today for Science Chat. Next week on Tuesday in Science Chat, we have Doc, Dr. Keith Barr who is an expert in muscle fitness. Um, So he's studied how to get in shape. I I could listen to that, I guess. I could get into better shape. Um, So (laughs) anyways, he's an awesome guy. Uh, He really knows his stuff. He'll be able to give you some tips and tricks. Uh, And he, he, uh, yeah, he's got a doctorate in kinesiology. So he knows what he's talking about for sure. Thank you again for joining our space. You could be anywhere in the world, but you decided to come to Science Chat, and I hope you're all treated to the amazing guest, Danielle Bush. One more time, Danielle, thank you for being our guest tonight. Okay, we'll, we'll talk to everybody on Saturday for Pet Chat. Hope to see you there, and next week for Science Chat with Dr. Keith Barr. Okay, take care, everybody, for science, empathy, and cuteness.